Why are we here today? We're here today because 50 million Americans are living in poverty and we're spending $1 trillion, um, not including Medicare and Medicaid, on uh, the government safety net. That's yep. almost 20% of our GDP. That's in line with uh, other developed countries, but our outcomes for poverty alleviation are not stellar. Um, and that's a problem. That's a problem for us as progressives. Because uh, as progressives, we all believe that government is part of the solution. That um, government has a really important role in helping those in need. That it's uh, the biggest nonprofit of them all, as Ashley is fond of saying. And uh, um, government, we believe as progressives, the government can be effective in solving the problems that we face together and can be good stewards of our tax dollars. Um, we believe all this as progressives, but um, unfortunately, we have often been wrong. Um, do you remember the day that healthcare.gov came out and um, it didn't work? The president's signature policy to fix a piece of the healthcare system and $800 million later, the government couldn't build a functioning website. It was like a punch in the gut as a progressive um, because your, your cousin at Thanksgiving who tells you we should shrink government and drown it in a bathtub because government can't do anything right, that day it felt like, it felt like he had a point. Government wasn't doing things right. Um, of course, we know that at the end of the day, it got fixed. And um, the folks who went in to fix that are folks like the people on the stage here today, just designers and geeks and product people, many of them from here in Silicon Valley, because of their work, because of their ability to bring in the tools and processes uh, of Silicon Valley that, uh, <clears throat> that we use to design and build great products, because they went and served their country, 20 million people have health insurance today. And a progressive policy was able to be implemented. There's still a lot of work to do. Healthcare.gov is a great story. I'll show you a couple examples of things that still really aren't working right with technology and government. This first example is what it looks like to sign up for uh, food stamps in California. Um, it's gonna go fast here, it's on warp speed, so watch with me. But even though it's going fast, you'll see it takes a really, really long time. There are a lot of steps, 50 screen, over 50 screens. This is really hard. You have to work with a, housing, a counselor to do this. You have to do it over and over again to get it right. Um, that's not how it should be. That's not how government should provide services. Here's an example of something much simpler. A few screens built on a mobile interface based on talking to real users about how they use the system. The ability to just sign right there on your screen and boom, you're signed up. That's how government can provide services. That's efficient, that's effective, and it's, it, it serves those who need it. Um, another example. This is what happens when your food stamps are about to be canceled in San Francisco. You get this. What are you, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> um, and, you know, here's just a, just a prototype of something that might work a little better. How about we just send a text message in your language of choice that says, hey, your, your benefits are about to expire. Give us a call if you have any questions. That's how government should work. That's how government can work. Um, <clears throat> and why, why would we address, if we were looking at the food stamp system, why would we address the, the last step when people are losing food stamps? Because the folks who approached this problem talked to hundreds of food stamp recipients before they started to solve a problem. They found out what was their pain point. And a huge pain point for folks is you're at the front of the line, you've brought all your groceries, your your EBT card gets run and it gets denied. And it's a moment of shame. It's a moment where you know your family's not gonna eat tonight. Um, and this was, this was really bad for people and it was because they were getting dropped off and they didn't understand how to renew their benefits. So simple solutions solve big problems when we spend time talking to our users and understanding what their real needs are. Um, so who's doing this work? Um, Lots of different folks. Some of the folks on the stage today from ATF, um, from the mayor's office in San Francisco, um, out of the healthcare.gov um, rescue, ATF and the US uh, Digital Services Agency were born. Um, they're doing amazing work at the federal level, uh, along with 
Code for America and other folks doing tons of work uh, locally across the country, from Boston to Mesa, um, and, uh, and internationally. The government of the UK, uh, folks all over Africa are doing amazing work uh, bringing the tools of design and agile development to government to make effective product. Um, so as progressives, we can all help. We can all help make government work. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit today about um, the these tools and processes of Silicon Valley uh, that are being used in government to make effective change. Um, here with me today are um, Ashley Meyer from the city and county of San Francisco, mayor's office of Civic Innovation. Um, Jesse Taggart, director of product strategy. Product strategy and design. Product yeah, strategy and design consulting, and consulting group, yeah. And 18F is part of GSA. Stephanie Rivera is also uh, from 18F GSA mm -hmm. and is a director of uh, business strategy. So um, thank you all for joining me today. And uh, I was hoping we could just have a <coughs> brief Ooh. conversation about some of the things you guys are working <laughs> on. So um, maybe just to start with some framing. Um, can we start with 18F. Can you guys talk a little bit about the, the methods that you use and the, the projects that you're working on? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, I can assume that everybody is somewhat familiar with 18F. Is that true? Maybe a is little background. A little, no, no. A little background. No? no? Yeah. OK, yes. good. Thanks. Yeah, set it up. Um, yeah. So uh, 18F, we are, ooh, we are we're like a year and a half old. Uh, we officially launched March uh, 2014. We had 15 people. Um, as of last week, I think we have 144 people um, currently on staff, kind of throughout the United States. Um, our main headquarters, or the government, we belong to the General Services Administration, is in Washington, D.C., and then we have um, a good, a good uh, number of people out here as well. But we started for a couple of different reasons. Um, healthcare.gov did not go so well. You may have heard about it. Um, for anybody who says that this is a reason that government should be small, I would counter that with um, the reason we had healthcare.gov is because we outsourced so much of our knowledge because we were trying to make government so small. Um, we outsourced our knowledge and we outsourced our technical capabilities. Um, and because we did that, we became very, very bad clients um, for vendors that we were bringing in. Um, and with healthcare.gov, we did not know how to um, assess products correctly. We were being briefed in PowerPoint and accepting it. We weren't looking at prototypes. Um, so what we needed to do is bring back that expertise, bring back that knowledge into the federal government so that we could be good stewards of our own digital strategy going forward. We can start asking the right questions. We can start building things for ourselves. We can start being the trusted advisors that other agencies need to know. Is this going to work? What do you mean this has to go on a mobile platform? How do, how do I make that happen? Um, came out of healthcare.gov, also came out of uh, the PIF program, which is the Presidential, Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. It was started as a, a six, mo six months to a year. You can come out, take a tour of service within the federal government, um, kind of like dive bomb into an agency um, and help them out. A lot of people did not want, didn't feel like they had enough time. Six months just wasn't enough time to get some of these projects off the ground. They tried to stay a little bit longer. Um, we were fortunate enough, they were part of the White House at the time. White House is pretty limited by the number of people it can have within it. Um, we were brought over to GSA so that the General Services Administration, and given, given an administrative home, really, so that we could, we could build up, we could flourish to 144 that we have now. Um, and so that we could start taking on larger, longer-term projects. Um, we can get into more of those, and we can get definitely into procurement, because that's one of the things that uh, we saw as a big flag that needed to be changed. But you can really think of 18F as a, um, a consultancy within the government for the federal government. Um, and it, we have designers and engineers, and we have fantastic people who heretofore have not been able to get into 
the federal government. So that was another bureaucratic hack that we can talk Stephanie, about. Stephanie, I could speak to that a little bit yeah. if you want. And really, and, um, and Jesse, you're doing some of this work. Yeah, I was, I was just yeah. going to say, yeah. Um, so like my background is an experienced designer. Um, I'm leading a team within the consulting group. But we also are doing like design and research design and build as well as different consultancies things. And it's amazing. I think we're like at 120, 140 folks now. Yep. Um, and there are product designers, which are user researchers, user experience designers, interface designers, visual designers, content strategists, very important, um, product managers, um, engineers, obviously, DevOps, um, mm -hmm. obviously. Huge. Um, and the methods we're bringing, it's, it's fascinating to be doing it from inside the government instead of like the, the contracted vendor relationship. There are some things in... in, in uh, progress that we're making in that one we're bringing like human centered agile methods the topic of this of this um, talk here into the government and working with our partners one of our principles is like meet them where they are and you know start educating that way some folks have been are very knowledgeable and just need a little you know support from the outside or validation from what we're trying to do and some folks it's very new to them and we're teaching these methods and how to like think differently um, within projects that they work directly with us and then also how they work with different um, the word agency in the government is used like 10 different ways here but with private you know agencies or vendors that we work with as well because um, like both both sides of, of this of the relationship need the freedom to do the best work they can so yep. anything from like practices to policy like we're doing we're doing a lot of hopefully work in that area and making progress awesome yeah and, and Ashley you're doing a lot of this work in the the, the local level Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what human-centered design and agile have meant to the city of San Francisco? Yeah. So I'm part of a team in the mayor's office called the Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation, which Mayor Lee created when he took office. So we've been around for about close to three years now. And um, four, close to four years, I suppose. And uh, I joined um, this year. I'm doing a one-year fellowship. So it's the Mayor's Innovation Fellows modeled on the Presidential Innovation Fellowship Program and the Code for America Fellowship Program. Um, designed to bring external folks into city government for a year. And um, MOKI, the Office of Civic Innovation, does not explicitly focus on technology, but my background was at Code for America, a nonprofit that does government technology work. And so that's kind of the perspective I've brought to the role. And um, a lot of the work I've been doing this year and seeing my colleagues around the city do is around human centered design and agile development. Um, it is, uh, there are emerging concepts, I think, in the city of San Francisco, but we're seeing some small successes and wins here and there when it comes to, um, like, our assessor's office last year redesigned their entire website and rewrote all the content from scratch, um, testing it with real users as they went, and really bringing in both subject matter, matter experts and content strategists to do that. Um, are the new homeless navigation center in San Francisco, uh, a designer and a developer from our Department of Technology built in about six weeks the intake application that the counselors use for the clients there and um, kicked the whole thing off with a design sprint and then really used agile methods to build it really quickly and only give the counselors really what they need when they're um, doing those client interviews. And so we're kind of seeing in these small pieces in departments this idea of service design, this idea of user-centered design mm -hmm. emerging and I think um, now we're thinking about how to institutionalize that and really support all the people throughout the city who want to bring that approach to their work. Great. And Jesse, maybe for the audience, uh, you could just define for us, for you, what are, what are these words, service design, human-centered design, Sure. Quick definitions and, and why those are important. Sure. Yeah, I can give like a, a quick definition, and there's a lot more like eloquently articulated than I'm, than <laughs> than what I'm about to do. Um, but I say this: what I'm about to say, I say it in a very calculated sense, in that I feel like human-centered design or user-centered design, and I use those terms interchangeably, is common sense. And I say that because I'm often dealing or working with partners and clients, and and where they feel like it needs to be a special designer only knows this. Um, and it's basically just, you know, people are motivated by goals, um, needs, attitudes, and in the simple, I'm really boiling this down, like in the simplest sense, understand what those goals, needs, and attitudes, and build to that, you know, working with whatever your business or organizational objectives are. Um, so many times, and well-meaningly so, um, and there's a bunch of tools and methods from soci socio socio sociology backgrounds, um, ethnographic techniques, um, design techniques, mean, there's a whole you know, panopticon of, of methods to do this, but um, 
so often, you know, people just start thinking in terms of systems. Well, the system will do this, you know, and like, and someone like, I've built it to meet all the requirements. And then it's like, well, the human can't use this system now. Like, you know, you have checked off all those boxes. So I think like human-centered design, I was just talking to someone about this this morning, actually, is, and, and using those methods can like often help the people or the organizations inside government or the client or the partner achieve their stated goal easier than they think, right? Yeah. Um, and that gets people attention because that means you're going to save time and you're going to save money and be more effective. So, I mean, I can talk about the methods used, but just like from a high level, that's... That's great. That's I love you calling it common sense. I think that kind of really yeah. speaks to the idea that, um, that there's, there's definitely a process to bring, to teach, but that really everyone can be a designer, right? And that it's, it's about asking the right questions and uncovering those needs first and then deciding what we're going to yeah. build to meet those yeah. needs rather than going in the other direction. Yeah. I feel like, like, like capital D design, like anyone can, or it's like a literacy to be learned. Yeah. And then I'm going to, so I used to be a visual designer, and so lowercase d design, I'm, I'm going to get myself in trouble by just do, having done that. Um, you know, when you slide down and you're in like the details of the UI or complicated workflows, then you want folks that like have experience. But like from the product strategy designing of experiences, everyone should feel empowered. Um, and, we're, and we're doing that. There's, you know, when I'm doing user research and interviews, like I want to, I involve the partner with me, like pair with me and do the interview. Um, bring a developer when you're doing, you know, usability testing. It's not separated silos of that. So. Right. Um, Teach a man to fish. Yeah. 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 That's great. And Ashley, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how agile development complements the human-centered design process. And I think yeah. it just began to speak to that, speaking about this, the rapidness of delivery mm -hmm. and the ability to, to deliver small things. Um, yeah. So. I don't know how many people in the room are technologists or not, but uh, agile development is a way of building software that has become best practice in the private sector over the last t 10 to 20 years. But um, there's still parts of the private sector that are moving to that model, and the public sector, for the most part, has not. And um, the, the benefits of agile, which basically breaks the development of a piece of software or a website or a web product down into tiny little pieces, um, so like about two to three weeks long usually, they're called sprints. Um, it means that you uh, are not trying to plan for all the features you'll need and everything you'll do in two plus years of development or months and months of development, but instead saying, what's the most important next piece to build and let's build, it, let's build that very quickly. And um, at the end of that two weeks or three weeks, it's done enough that you can test it right away with new users. So that means that throughout the whole development process, you're putting something in front of new users, in front of your users and seeing how they respond to it. And that's very different from an, uh, older models where you might build for six or eight months before ever showing something to a real person and seeing how they respond to it. And you can get pretty far off track in six to eight months. And so um, Agile and human-centered design go really hand in hand. I was actually having lunch at 18F yesterday. Um, they have a weekly potluck, and we were talking about this, that like, it's almost unnecessary to separate the two because um, part of testing with users as you go is so closely part of Agile, and that is also really fundamental to user-centered design. And so. Um, it's very easy to introduce the two of them as, yeah. as almost one concept, that you want to really think about your user needs first, and then the whole time as you go, every time yeah. you add a new feature, you test it with a user. So if you're building a web product and you want to be able to email people, for example, and you build that feature, OK, now we can send people emails. Right away, you then t take a bunch of test users, mm -hmm. send them the email, and see, like, did it, go, did it work? Like, did they yeah. open it? Did they yeah. un understood what they read? That sort of thing. Yeah. And I would just add on to this is, it's been really fascinating in like this the large Fed space mm -hmm. because like I I keep finding opportunities where like agile development methods and tools and the drinking the agile Kool Aid so to speak um, is really useful with like project organization as well mm -hmm. um, and I'm realizing there's so many like layers like in some of these large projects and I'll give an example for the, like Data Act we've been doing consulting work. Um, and we helped, we did a pilot, Small Business Administration, we did a pilot with them to help them implement it. So like long, long story short, you know, Congress passes this law um, and then every agency is to implement it by a certain time. You know, thou shalt do this. You know, it's a good law, it, is, it has good intentions and great benefits that will come as, it, as it's realized. And, but it's this overwhelming thing in a sense that, that gets passed down as like, you know, that's what you should accomplish. And we worked with them to be like, 
you know, the users at that point of the law is actually kind of themselves and like all the data structures and the independencies are like, mm -hmm. you just can't map it all out. And like, we can help you start, you know, and by starting this, you actually will learn more to answer the questions that are stopping you from starting in the first place, if you can follow that. Um, so that's been a, a really good experience of bringing agile development to kind of like the product strategy and then the actual development of, of what in that case was a prototype, to yeah. a learning thing, because it's so complex. You need to know that and move forward. And um, we've been doing workshops with other agencies and we'll be doing more in the fall to help them use that, use that method to respond to this law that was passed that they need to like um, build. Awesome. So, yeah. And uh, Stephanie, I think, you know, uh, Ashley and Jesse has spoken a bit to sort of the benefits of agile and human-centered design yeah. designers and developers working together, building things quickly, getting them in front of users, testing them often, having better product built more efficiently, more effectively, getting it out sooner. Um, that's not typically how government has done business. Government uh -huh. has written large sets of requirements mm -hmm. and dictated no. a project plan. Yeah. Where the designers come yeah, first, we like, we like and the our, developers our... come second, and you're going to sign on the dotted line and tell me this is how long mm -hmm. it's going to take. Yeah, yeah. And when it takes you longer or costs you more, I'm going to crack the whip. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yep. and we assume that we understand everything about our problem before we start mm -hmm. solving mm -hmm. any of it because we've written the RFP. Yep. Those are my RFP people. The RFP is the Bible. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what folks are used to. You have a lot of experience in that world, I think. Yeah. How does human-centered design and agile map to that world of the, yeah. the government has been working um, Well, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people, so coming from D.C. to here, people just like assume you should be building with agile, but a lot of, you know, I would say that the typical, you know, federal worker, it's equivalent to they've always been walking around with a flip phone, right? They have a flip phone, and then you come in with agile human-centered design, and it's like, it's a beautiful smartphone. And they're like, whoa, whoa, I didn't know about that. I didn't know you could do that, but for years and years, I've been so super happy with my flip phone because before that I had a, a rotary dial, you know? So they, they, they think that they are progressing, but they didn't realize that there was so much further to go. Um, so that's to say that they're not doing waterfall RFPs, you know, all of these writing. Of, they're not doing it because it's a nefarious purpose or because they're stupid. They, they're doing it because they don't know another way to do it. And I really think that that's where 18F and um, human-centered de design comes in. So we can be a trusted partner and say, look, you trust me, I'm in this game with you, let's, let's test it out. And with the sprints, you can just test it out for two weeks. You can say, let's, this isn't gonna cost you anything. We're gonna test it out. I'm gonna talk to some users. I'm gonna validate what you say. You think you need X, I'm gonna validate that your users need X. And if I come back and say, actually your users need X and Y, that starts another conversation. And what we've seen is that um, you know, our clients in the federal government, they're hungry for that kind of trusted advisorship. Mm -hmm. um, they, they got into civil service because they want to do right by people. Um, and they want things to be better. But they really need somebody to come in mm -hmm. and say, it'll be okay. This is a new way of doing it. You're not breaking the law. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is... I swear to you, I have done this before. And I really think that that's what 18F can provide. And Jesse's one of the people that, um, you know, we send in for, for these groups that are like, mm, I, don't, I don't know about you guys. You guys and you're wearing your jeans and all, all of that nonsense. Yeah, exactly. Um, and she goes in and she maps out, okay, well, what is your problem? What, is, what are you trying to solve for? And then she takes that and she does a beautiful design workshop. Um, and then goes back and says, okay, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to verify this with your actual users, and you have to give me the users. And if um, the client then comes back to us and says, no, 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 we do this by committee. We know what our users want. And you're like, we're not your people. We have these principles, well, and, and we want to talk to your users, so why don't you talk to your users with us? Yeah, can, can I hop, hop yeah. in here? Because there's two things. One is like, sometimes you get resistance and there's lots of different ways to um, approach the resistance and that yeah. could be a whole workshop in itself. Um, but the other thing, I wanted to like hop onto something you said earlier because I, I feel this really strongly. It's like, so I've been in government for a year 
um, a very long time ago as a museum exhibit designer, and I worked for like we designed exhibits for like the Navy or the Smithsonian. I, I had that, I had that, but not like directly as a Fed, right? Um, oh my gosh, I'm losing my point. Wait, oh, is like so coming into government. I've been in government for a year, and I I feel like there's two things I'm I'm seeing. One is like we're coming in as you mentioned, like the trusted advisor, yeah. showing methods um, that people have not been exposed before, getting them to be comfortable with them, seeing the value, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also, and I feel very strongly about this, there are people inside of the government, it's so huge, and there's so, mi so much bureaucracy, right? There's so much that they do, and they know about all this, and on their own private time or their own philosophies, mm -hmm. they, they are, they want to practice agile, agile. they want to practice human-centered yep. design, and there's such like a cluster of bureaucracy, the, the way projects are organized, you're not sure who, who the clear ownership is, so that's like number one recommendation for like everything that I touch, like have a clear owner. Um, and then the procurement process, you know, like you, you have this so much po ac accumulation of well-meaning policy and rules that it's hard to even hire the people you want to work with if you don't happen to have them in as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just want to say like it's, and, and it can't happen, this is the last time I stick here, but like it can't happen without a mix of like folks coming from private industry, but it's not, that's not the solution. It's mixing no. with the folks already who have been working in government trying to do this for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they're, it's, they're it's, very accepting. We don't get a lot of, we don't get a lot of pushback yeah. once we come in um, and say, you know, yeah. this, is, this is how we work, it's new, it's different, but yeah. we've had a lot of success before, you know, let's, yeah. let's try this for a little yeah. bit. And, and usually people are pretty hooked, actually. You use this word, Stephanie, that people are hungry for ad yes. advice and advisorship. Absolutely. And I think that's absolutely true. I, I think they're also hungry for the results. Like, yeah. nobody knows better than the people who run those programs how bad that customer experience yep. is, like the one you showed for enrolling yeah. in food stamps. Like, yeah. there's a reason why a consortium of counties spent millions of dollars to build that, because they wanted to invest a lot of resources in fixing the user experience of rolling, enrolling in food stamps. So like clearly something went wrong along the way and we ended up mm -hmm. with this like 50 screen process and there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that went wrong. Probably. Yeah. But the intention, I, I bet you that I, I haven't seen the RFP that like probably 15 times in the RFP that built that it said like must be an easy user experience, must be a beautiful user experience. They're, they have that value. It's just that um, the folks inside government don't necessarily know how to get there. Yep. And they don't know how to get the right vendors to work with. They don't know what mm -hmm. to ask of those vendors. They don't know how to work with the vendors once they're there. Yep. And, um, but they want to learn. They're eager for new solutions and new ways of working because they, they have the same hunger that we do for beautiful, simple, easy to use public services. And they really feel the pain when their customers don't have that user experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was going to say, you know, the, for the food stamps, they're there to help the people get yeah. the food stamps. There, there is no malice in building 50 screens. Maybe they won't be able to get to the food stamps. I don't know. Maybe no. they only get to screen 49. They want people to be able to get the food stamps. And they, they desperately want these services to work. Um, they just don't know how to do it yet. And right. So you guys have a really important role. I think all three of you are playing a role inside of government, helping to teach process, to bring tools, to get buy-in, push people past their comfort zone and have them see successes. Um, but you touched on vendors as well. And I think that you know, the, the government is the largest purchasing agent in the world. Um, it's and, one of the biggest, yeah. Uh, uh, and so vendors have a role to play here. Um, how does one be, you know, my, my company is a vendor. H mm -hmm. How do we be a good vendor? How do we mm. partner in a way that supports uh, effective tools being built? Me? You want me to take it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, okay. I um, so one, I think it's, uh, I think that we on the government side need to be able to help um, vendors who traditionally have not worked with the federal government before. I think there's, there's quite a high barrier to entry, um, which is, it's pretty unfortunate and the government and the taxpayers and the American people, everyone is, is really feeling that, right? Um, I can tell you one of the successes that we've had with 18F um, is that we've set up something called the Agile BPA. It's a blanket purchase agreement. Um, and we set it up completely, completely differently. Um, it was quite a political battle. But uh, what we said was we don't want the RFP like you've always written the RFP. We don't, we're looking for people who work like us. And so we are going to 
um, test out people who work like us. We are going to give you a data set. We are going to give you a problem. Build it. Turn it in. You can write up your process and how you got to build, but you're limited to five pages. The end. I know, I saw your jaw drop, right? I mean, yeah, you've probably written like pretty good RFPs that were like, yeah, 50 pages, right? Five pages. And then, oh, and all by, by the way, it all has to be up on, on GitHub. And we're going to test it all. Um, and we were able to get uh, companies, small vendors, large vendors, people who've never worked in the government space before to answer this call to be on the Agile BPA. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's a lot. We got a lot. And this was our first tranche, um, trying to get people in to see, okay, can we start recommending? Because 18F, we have way too much business coming in for us to handle. We just, we absolutely cannot handle the need that's out there. But what we want to do is to be able to verify that there are other vendors who work like us, who have human-centered design, agile methodologies, this is what they do, and we want to be able to refer them over to say, we can't handle this challenge that you have at the moment, but this is a trusted partner with us. Um, you could come and, and work with them. And that's one yeah. of the ways we're working on it. Yeah, and I, I pause when you ask that question because I've been, my mind space, my headspace has been so much thinking about what we can do to, to work better with vendors. Like, and so the flip, I was like, I had to just pause there. I was like, good question. Um, and just briefly, like, I mean, ATNF is doing a lot of work. To, I feel like we're doing a lot of work, one, for help us work better within, within the agencies. I mean, there's so many different agencies and opportunities. But through that work, because everything we're doing is open and open source and released and, you know, follow our blog. We have a lot going on, atnf.gsa.gov. <laughs> um, but, like, we just recently, um, the design team just recently uh, released, like, a first pass of, you know, a V1 of, like, um, the words, uh, 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 design standards. Like, here's, here's a, a UI kit that you can use that we know is 508 compliant, like out of box, you can trust it. You know, your agency partner will trust it. Um, uh, method cards, sharing, helping educate, like how we do the design process, that sort of thing. And there's a lot of other things going on. Um, but to your question of like how you can work better, um, there are a lot of like contractual and, you know, the, the Agile BPA and, and things that, you know, like, you know, participate in. But I, on a tactical level, and I, I'm still forming this, but like on a tactical level, like when, say you have a, a client, and I'm thinking maybe in the Fed space, but it, it's like framing it, and it's hard not to because there's such a pressure of requirements and policy, and the government's in the risk aversion business. So it, like you're dealing in fear, you know, and on some level or another, fear and aspiration, like you have to figure it out. And it's like how to frame your relationship with them so it's more of a partnership, keep it focused on the on the what and not the how that you're delivering because once you're in the how then everyone's like is this like well is that the right thing or not versus like like the, the benefit of that mm -hmm. um, and there's a third point that I'm going to remember later yeah. I think the yeah. what's yeah. pretty important yeah. actually yeah. you get yeah. into the how and yeah. the government's got the yeah. how they've got yeah. like 22 steps right. to get to well, that signed yeah. paper right yeah. but if you keep focused on the what yeah. and, and if you're like if it's just a like like, it's not like, oh, you're just there to crank out code and solve something. Um, or maybe that, 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 I mean, that's a whole different discussion of maybe those instances. But when it has to do with, like, the user experience and it's focused around a goal, you're in a partnership, you're helping, depending on your client, you're helping educate them on how to make decisions about that, like, as a teaching process, yeah. too. So. I think that of a couple things. The first one is maybe a little obvious, but, like, come be a government vendor. <laughs> like, yeah. There's a lot of really amazing yeah. design mm -hmm. and development firms who don't consider government contracts. And um, government has a lot of work to do to make um, and then not our solicitations easier to read and easier to find. Um, but there are a lot of really important, meaningful, interesting problems. Um, if you want to be working on like hunger, homelessness, public art, housing, <laughs> uh, veterans at the federal level, veterans services, immigration, um, college access, like government is the place to do all that stuff. Like yes, you can go. Um, take on nonprofits as clients who work on those issues, but government is going to be way bigger and have way more scale and way more reach. So um, if, you, if your firm is interested in working on clients that work on social issues, government is potentially the biggest and most impactful one. Um, and I would say that's probably the, one of the best ways to be a good vendor is to be a good shop and then be a vendor. Um, and then two other things. One is uh, uh, teach the teaching man the fish thing, which is like, 
even if you don't normally do this, invite your government to send some developers to pair program with you. Invite them to send, they may not have any designers, but invite them to send some people <laughs> to design cool. with you. Um, yeah. uh, maybe you don't normally do this, but teach them what you're doing as you do it. Don't let it be like your special private sector wizard magic. Like, give them a workshop on Agile, give them a workshop on user-centered design. Like, stop for an hour or two to tell them what you're doing so that they um, don't just like see a better product at the end, but understand why the product is better this time as compared to other vendor relationships they've had. And then um, I would also say like extreme transparency, like let them, if you're using Jira or Pivotal Tracker, like let them in, like show them your user stories, let them approve user stories, sh let them help you write acceptance criteria, like really partner with them even more than you might normally because they need to learn how this works. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one is like, uh, help government like it release itself from the cycle of maintenance contracts and always relying on external vendors like let them learn the yeah. code base provide them with really good documentation um, at the end of your contract help them figure out how they're going to maintain it in a way that's sustainable don't make them dependent on a proprietary solution so whatever you can do to help them sort of be better customers i think which yeah. is sort of a noble ask but i would hope that it's your government too like you're the shareholders <laughs> yourself so um you'll have that sort of self-interest as a citizen. Yeah. yeah. And so there's, there's clearly a role for the private sector to play here, a, a big role. Um, and I think you know, we're all here in part because uh, we'd like to help um, make government an effective uh, lever for change, right? And I think we're here at SOCAP where a lot of the conversation is about how ca capital can be a lever for change. How do we bring these conversations together? How can capital be a part of making government more efficient, more effective at, at making progressive change. Yeah. Do you want to? I mean, I uh, invest in <laughs> startups that are building tech for government. Don't yeah. write off the government industry as too hard to break into because um, Mikey Dickerson, who's the head of the US Digital Service, has this quote that the line right now between public and private sector tech is porous. It's like permeable. We can cross it. And I think that's true also for capital and true for startups. And so we're working on the demand side, but we need your help to meet us in the middle and support the supply side. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would say like every every day, or at least a handful of times a week, you know, is like, what is, is there anything off private off the shelf that we can use? Is there something open source off the shelf that we can use as well? Um, we do, what 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 should we be building ourselves, and what has obviously been solved out there, and how do we interact with that in an open way? So, um, I would say one of the one of the best ways that capital could probably help out with the federal government and really understand the, um, the, the challenges from inside is uh, we have people that come in for, you know, a couple months rotations. If you have, if you have, you know, engineers, if you have designers, if you have people that, you know, have been working really hard and you know that they're super civic minded, um, release them for a little bit <laughs> you know send yeah. send them over and and let them know that they that they can come back um, we find that people you know as as government is is hungry for learning new methods and they honest to god they want it to be better for everyone i've seen out here that people are also really hungry for some civic engagement um, you know i can't tell you how many people come to me and say I, I want to make a change. I've spent my entire career, I've spent the last 16 years, I make a great video game. And I need to do something that's feeding my soul. Um, and so, I, you know, I would say if, if you have the means and, and you want to be able to do that, to um, allow some people to take a, you know, a spin at um, city, federal, state government, um, go back, teach what they know. It'll make you a better... Uh, vendor, it'll probably make them a better citizen, um, and I, I really think that the the solution to getting ahead of this is that we work together in like the most open, porous way possible. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, um, one more thing you can do: the mayor has a startups in residence program that brings a cohort of startups into uh, city government to embed themselves for four months and work with departments. And it's a very mutually beneficial uh, partnership because the startup gets like unprecedented opportunity to work with real users and the government gets to see how a startup builds a product. Um, we had the first cohort last year and we'll be doing another one in the spring. So if you know of any civic-minded companies who are working on a product that might benefit from 
partnering with government, we'd, I'd love to talk to you and we'd love to have them apply. Yeah, cool. And, and Ashley, in a way, you know, you're, you're a fellow, right? Yeah. And so you're, you're kind of <laughs> doing what Stephanie is suggesting. Yeah. Thank you for your work. Thank um, you. I think in the last year, you've seen a lot of wins from the mayor's office. Um, you guys have the programs that you just mentioned. Have there been any challenges? What's the, what's the most challenging thing you've done this year? Um, my job is challenging every day, uh, as all good jobs are, I think. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is that there's so much to do. Government is, uh, the city of San Francisco is so big and we're working on so many things for the residents of San Francisco and with them. And um, sometimes it's hard to know where to start or which pieces to try to bite off first. Jesse, you've worked with a number of different agencies. What are the biggest challenges? And, and, and yeah. we'll be optimistic too. What are the biggest I was going to say, like, I actually yeah. was just thinking, like, I want to share, like, a challenge that actually ended up being a win. I'm not just like, that's like the interview question yeah. technique <laughs> of all times, but um, which was like, I, I did a, a three day workshop with Department of Labor um, a couple weeks ago. And the challenge was that it was just, we, we tried to achieve a lot in three days. So, like, it was the hardest thing was, like, I realized we had bit, like, bit off a, a huge, a very aggressive, optimistic agenda um, and pulled together a team last minute, like, you know, with some planning and then last minute additions that helped us achieve that because we were trying to deal with, like, a specific workflow of a, of, of a product within all this stuff. I want to, like, help respect that and, and not talk about it yet. But, like, we worked on this specific workflow that had never been, like, updated or looked at. Um, and there's so many, like, it's like a big ball of yarn because it's not just, oh, yes, of course, you know, the online, f you know, the form should be online and not like a handwritten, you know, filled out form. And of course this and of course that. But there's also like this collection of like policy concerns and process concerns and people, the teams that like realize this mission for this one part of the DOL, like, is distributed all over the team. And so we quickly got in there and we had like this like, we did a lot of like kind of like vision, big picture like exercises, and at the end we did two two prototyping tracks. And one was the expected like let's do like spin up like a what would happen if your form was digital and how might that work? And and that was great. And we got to like model um, how that works actually. In the conversation, we had a policy person in the room and the person who processes these applications like talking together, and that was a huge win, you know. Um, and then the other track was like how might you improve this workflow without any technical solution, you know? What are the like what are the workflow and we use like some agile methods like to kind of break that down, which is that's why I talk about like agile with project management and well as well. So it's kind of a win in that like after the workshop ended, they're talking they're still talking to each other now and they're still realizing like this phrase of like what can any of you in this room do differently next week, you know, or the next mm -hmm. two weeks. Like you don't need the eighteen month procurement process. To, to wait for it to start, like what are the things you can do? So it ended up being a win, but like the challenge was like we, we tried to do a lot just in three days, so. Speaking of procurement, I imagine you've had a few challenges uh, in your time. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of, um, <laughs> I do a, a lot of reinterpretation of, uh, you know, the rules and some of the, the laws and some of the legislature. I work very closely with our Office of General Counsel um, to see what we can and can't do. Uh, some of the things that you hear people are, uh, often, I will suggest something and we'll be hit with, that's illegal. You can't do it. It's completely illegal for the following reasons. I was like, yeah, where is it illegal? Like, where, what's saying I can't actually do that thing I want to do? Um, and a lot of times it's just an interpretation of a law, right? So we can reinterpret laws. We can reinterpret statute. We can go back to Congress and ask them to um, better explain what they had intended when they wrote this. That is perfectly a legitimate thing to do, and we do it a lot. Um, also, sometimes it's just the way it's always been. And that's just not a really good answer, you know? So um, we, we fight pretty hard against that, that sentiment. And we do a lot of um, bureaucratic hacking, mm -hmm. I think, to, to mm -hmm. come in to say that things can be changed just a little bit different and no one's going to jail. No, this is not gonna happen. Um, you have to get the attorneys on your side which, thank God we got some good ones. Um, but that, that is the biggest challenge to, I think, procurement at the, at the moment. Um, but I'm thankful that we have people um, that are coming in that can see how things could be different and how things could be better because I think that 
we have been lacking that new blood and that new knowledge and that new enthusiasm for a while. Yeah. I love that term, uh, bureaucratic hacking. Yeah. yeah, whenever I introduce myself, you know, so Jesse's a design. Yeah, everybody's got a thing that they do, right? Except for me. And I just tell people that I'm a full stack bureaucrat. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm your memo writer. I'm your congressional liaison. I'm your press secretary. Yeah. We need so we solidarity. Need solidarity. Yeah. I love that. With, yeah. a, with a few minutes we have left, um, are there any questions that uh, you yeah. I think I see a few over here. I think there's a microphone coming down. Testing. So I'm an, uh, I'm an organization development specialist, and we've done a bunch of projects in culture change with government. Yeah. And the struggle we've had is trying to meet their waterfall RFP because we don't know where we can get in a culture change within Doctor. government. And so we're about to do a, a new one. Um, we're having conversations with a very large uh, county government agency. Um, and it's a culture change. They've gone from 300 employees to 1,700 employees in a year and a half. And obviously, they've swamped yeah. their culture. Yeah. So the struggle I have is in responding to the RFP requirements and meeting that and saying, I can meet these outcomes, but I don't know. Any advice? Um, well, I could speak to you further about how you're, what department you're going after. Because, so there's, there's two sides to it, right? Like there's one side is the vendor community wanting to come in, wanting to be able to take on some of these challenges. Um, the other side is that you also have, a, have to have a willing participant. Um, and you have to have somebody who, who understands why this could be or should be different. Um, if an RFP is asking for waterfall and you really want to answer it, I would, I would answer it and let them know probably why this other method could be a better method. I would take a chance on that. Um, you have to remember that the people that are reviewing these, these RFPs that they come in, um, they're, just, they're just normal people. Um, some of them are looking to check the boxes you know, do they have this? Yes. Do they have this? Yes. Do they have this? Yes. But more often than not, there are people that are from within the office who do want to see the problem solved. Um, so, and you know, we've, we've taken that approach before. Yeah. Of saying, okay. I know you've, you're, you've written the RFP this way, but we'd like to suggest this methodology. Would you like to consider it and putting that in the response? Um, and we found that to be successful. Um, but it does come with challenges once you start doing the work. Yep. because um, they're not sure exactly what you're talking about. And um, <laughs> yeah. so it's re what's really helpful is to have relationships with folks like these who can be a trusted partner, right? You as a vendor, there is this experience that every agency is, every person in government has had with a vendor before. They've, they've had one, at least one bad relationship and they don't want to get burned again. And so when you have folks who can say, no, really, I'm on your side. I'm on this side of the curtain. <clears throat> Trust us, especially when they can get in before the RFP is written, yeah. really. I'm going to really help bring that change. Um, but having those partners to help build yeah. that culture is really important. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if this helps specifically within like the org consulting domain, because I'm kind of intrigued by that. But I know like with the, the stuff we're doing with like you know, software procurement and, and projects like that, where we're, we're encouraging people to do modular, agile contracts, um, small bits, not huge, like change to boil the ocean, like let's do this for this amount of time. It protects both sides in the relationship. And we're framing it where like, you're not buying a bunch of requirements being met, you're buying, you're buying brains, honestly, brains and time. Um, you know, with some sense of outcome, but not like that detailed list, because I've also talked to people who have been like well-meaning vendors, I'm going to go tech a little bit here, but like well-meaning vendors trying to accomplish something, saying like, oh, I could do this one user story that would improve the blah, blah, blah system, and their supervisor's like, it's not on the requirements list, you actually can't do that, mm -hmm. which is insane. Yeah. <laughs> so. I love that idea of sort of hiring, hiring brains, though, I think, you know, when you have great yeah. folks on your on your team, yeah. lead with them and, and have the reason that you're selected as a partner right. be because those are the folks that they want to work right. with. And right. I think that then helps establish that trust. They right. know that these are the right folks to do the work because of who they are, not because they've checked a bunch of boxes on the RFP response. Yeah. So. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Hey, um, my name's Kieran. I work for Cast. We basically make tech for good happen in the UK. So I'm clearly from London. 
uh, and we work a lot with GDS, that kind of area. In fact, my girlfriend works for GDS, so I can't get away from it. Um, one of the problems in the UK is this kind of government is awesome. The whole kind of agile processes, this is amazing. One of the problems we've had in the UK, we're three years on, there's a kind of impasse because we can work around the edges of improving access to government services through these great digital approaches. The problem is that where we've got to is that you're blocked by a wider transformational change in the way the government operates. And it's, it's it, it, try and bring Agile into the heart of government. That's the block we've got to, right? And I want to kind of put that forward as a thing to kind of get your, your thoughts and, and interest on that. You can tinker with the edges, but actually getting into the heart of it is, is the barrier we're now facing. Can, I'm so sorry. It's an acoustic perfect storm here. Yeah. What, what was the question? It's just there's background. Uh, so the question is really, yeah. can you work around the edges okay. improving access to services? Thank you, Carol. You're really talking about how do we how do we go yeah. from yeah. around the edges working in the heart? You guys are yeah. kind of in the belly of the beast. Well, <laughs> yeah. So I also think that you know, um, GDS and US USDS, the US Digital Service, and 18F, we sort of have like a little love affair with each other, right? Because um, GDS came first, and they got they got all this parliamentary support, and they've got they got a cabinet office, and they were able to actually like literally bring all of the technology in together into one spot. And that's, you know, that's sort of like our, our dream, right? That we would have one office. But um, I also think that um, what that allows is for you to have one really great office, but you're kind of insular, right? Um, so our approach is a, a little bit different. Um, I, you know, I've said this before, but I'm hoping that um, digital strategy, good technology within the federal government spreads like a virus. Like I want it everywhere. I don't want it just in 18F. I don't want it just in GSA. I want it in education. I want it in veterans affairs. I want the little digital service teams to be everywhere. And I want there to be a legitimate career path for a technologist, a designer in federal government to go from agency to agency throughout their career. Like that is, that's my dream. Um, and I think that that is, you can see that how the U.S. approach is just a little bit different than GDS, although that was our dream in the beginning, was to be the U.S. side of, of GDS. Um, but I do think that in order for GDS, right now it's so protected, it's going to have to go out and find other pockets and try to start infecting yeah. Other, yeah. other parts of the government. If, if I can hop, hop yeah. on here... Um I don't know, <laughs> right? It's like, I mean, that's it. And, 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 and I mean, I'm going back to like the agile process. Sometimes you just have to start. So yeah, sometimes you just have to start and you're learning stuff. And, and in a way, this is such a non-prioritized thing of saying like all the things all the time. Um, and with enough people in actions happening from USDS, from the different type of things that we're experimenting with inside 18F, all different levels, like there's something there um, there's definitely top down, like you need like the C CIO level suite, like the folks running agencies to get them on board in the right way, to having like prime strategic examples that demonstrate something. So if there's like a critical thing or something that happens to an agency, um, how we can show how like modern best practices can respond to that goes a long way for building like um, currency and support inside other agencies as well. Um, Keep asking that question, and we're keep we're keep we're still learning. Like yeah. I don't have a good answer either, but I would say like the first thing that comes to mind is that like we're talking about this like iterative agile human centered approach when it comes to like the very yeah. bottom of what is a waterfall process. I'm hoping the non technologists in the audience are following these <laughs> software development terms, but um, like really governance starts when we elect people and they sit somewhere in a legislative body and make policy and then that like flows down to a department head yeah. and then to a prog program yeah. manager who then wants to build a digital tool. And so we're talking about using Agile down here where we're like in human-centered design to real build a really beautiful um, mm -hmm. service experience, like for example for food stamps. But um, what I think it becomes really transformative is when you get to the, that involving that whole cycle. So yeah. how does the Agile human-centered design work on that food stamp enrollment experience affect the policymakers' decisions about how many people yeah. to include in eligibility requirements for food stamps. And so um, 
that's a long way away, but I think you start to see when you plug in, um, this allows you to collect more data and open that data and see that data faster when you, when you digitize a service. And so um, then policymakers have more data to work with and have that data more quickly and they can test their policy ideas more quickly. And so what I, my vision you know, would be that um, it really gets to the heart of governance when you start involving the full policy making cycle yeah. in the service design process. Mm -hmm. And so that you can mm -hmm. be like testing and tweaking a policy as you go Whereas right now, that part all still happens 18 months earlier, mm -hmm. even, if, even if you're super iterative and human-centered when you implement it. Mm -hmm. all the, can I add on to that? Yeah. Another thing that I would do from just like a purely political perspective is if you wanted to get out and get into those other pockets, you know, not tinker around the edge, find somebody who needs a win. I mean, there are a lot of politicians that need wins out there, right? And there's a lot of elected officials, and they don't have so much time on their hands. Um, find those champions, because often they can take the, the bigger risks. They're incentivized to take the bigger risk, um, and they're incentivized to have the bigger reward. So that's been one of the things that, you know, we, we look for, is finding those champions at the upper echelons who have a lot to gain from the wins. So I work in government, and I totally resonate with the bureaucracy you're talking Sorry, about. <laughs> and one of the things in terms of the work that you're doing is I think of improved morale, um, better efficiency, increased productivity, which is something we all want. So I, as you know, in government, we measure everything. So I wondered if whether at the local or at the federal level, they're measuring this improved productivity, morale, and efficiencies that you're working on? Um, I don't know if we're, imp morale, we are not. Trust me, you're, you're improving morale. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I think, I don't know it's how we would measure it. You know, I don't know how to I've seen a lot of morale. excitement for the I folks that I think people are excited, with. yeah. What people yeah. really like about the iterative process is that you get to see wins really fast. Yeah. That's exciting. You get to feel like you're part of the process. You're not throwing something over the fence and waiting for your vendor to come back. You're part of the team. And I think that, that builds great culture and it, um, it, it, can, it can change people's career paths. So, yeah. um, it also connects people to the human impact of their work. Human-centered design does that by default because you're talking to yep. your users and seeing yeah. your users and that feels really good. Yeah. Yeah, we are able to show like some, um, you know, like more bureaucratic wins, like stuff with the, uh, the Agile BPA. You know, we had 400 respondents. We went through it and got back to everybody in uh, three weeks was kind of unheard of. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have those sorts of things that show, like when you do stuff with this methodology, with this type of design thinking, um, you are able to actually turn things around okay. quite a bit faster. What's the question Thanks, about so. measuring? So I, I, know I think it's we're going to have to, I okay. think we're gonna have okay. to wrap, yeah. So uh, I don't think we have time for any more questions, but thank you all. Thank you to the panelists. This yeah. is awesome. Thank you to Jen Polka for Code for America for the slides, um, which was <laughs> totally awesome. Thanks, Jen. Um, and yeah, thank you all to coming. Thanks for. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.